Hello everyone, my name is David Lodgeford and today I'm going to be talking to you about transliteration, particularly transliterating ancient Greek. Well, what is transliteration? Transliteration is the act of writing a word found in one language in the alphabet of another language. To transliterate a word is to write it using the equivalent letters of another alphabet. Let's look at two examples of transliteration from ancient Greek to English. Here is the ancient Greek word kalos. This is an adjective meaning beautiful or fine. You don't need to remember the meanings of these words in this lesson. We're just talking about transliteration, which is the process of alphabet mapping. So what we're asking here is how would kalos be written using the English alphabet? Kalos would be written kalos. Let's look at a second example now. Here is the noun hippos. Hippos means horse, and we might transliterate it as hippos. Pretty straightforward, it might seem. However, I'm going to explain that it's a bit more complicated than it initially appears. Now, before I explain how to transliterate ancient Greek words, I wish to explain why we need transliteration, because you might be thinking, why do we need to know how to write an ancient Greek word using our alphabet? Well, the first reason is for proper names. Proper names, that is, names of particular people or places, are mostly transliterated rather than translated. Okay, so for example, here is Socrates. We transliterate this as Socrates. And if you were translating an ancient Greek text and you, you came across Socrates, then you would render it Socrates. You would transliterate it rather than translate it. We will see that some names are in fact translated as opposed to transliterated, but in the vast majority of cases, you transliterate proper names. The second reason we need transliteration is because it can help us discover a word's derivatives. Derivatives are words in English derived from ancient Greek words. So for example, here is the ancient Greek word bios, meaning life. We could transliterate this word as bios. We can now look at bios and we can ask, do we have any words in English starting with bio or bios that are to do with life? And yes, we do. Biology, for instance, and biosphere, biometrics. The prefix in all of those words comes from the word bios in ancient Greek, meaning life. Now, you might wonder why this is useful. One, it might just be interesting to you, right, to see these derivatives in English. But more importantly, it can actually help you discover the meaning of a word in both ancient Greek and English. So, for example, say you came across the ancient Greek word bios, in a text and you didn't know what it meant, you could mentally and automatically transliterate it and question whether there are derivatives. And you could realise that all of the bio words like biology are to do with life in some sense. They're all connected to life. And thus you could infer the meaning of bios. And now this might seem far-fetched, but it really does happen. You can realise what an ancient Greek word means by thinking about the English words derived from it. But it also works the other way. Knowing ancient Greek might actually help you infer the meaning of an English word when you first come across it. So for example, we all know what biology means, but if we didn't, but we did know ancient Greek, bios, for instance, and you came across the term biology, you could infer from knowing bios what biology is the study of, because that suffix ology always denotes the study of or giving an account of. So biology is giving an account of life. That actually comes from the ancient Greek word logos, which can mean account. So it works both ways. Being able to transliterate an ancient Greek word can help you realize the meaning of that Greek word, or if you already know its meaning, then it can help you come to know the meaning of an English word that you haven't encountered before, potentially. Now this might seem far-fetched, like I say, but it does happen. And I should note that you can see I put bios in italics. And the reason for this is as follows. When you transliterate a Greek word, you should put it in italics if it's appearing in a text with other regular English words. Because putting it in italics makes it stand out and it shows that it's a transliteration of a foreign word. Let's look at a second example. Here is the ancient Greek word misos. Misos means hatred. And if we were to transliterate it, it would look like this, misos. And you can see that you transliterate the circumflex using that upwards arrow. I should note that you do not have to transliterate the circumflex, only if you wish to be very precise. Now, concerning derivatives, we can ask ourselves, are there any words to do with hatred 
in English, beginning in miss, for example, M-I-S. And yes, there are. For instance, we have the word misanthropy, which is the hatred of mankind, coming from misos, meaning hatred, and also the Greek word anthropos, meaning man, in the sense of person, rather than male. But we also get the word for hatred of males from misos. The word for hatred of males in English is misandry, and the word for hatred of women is misogyny. We get many words with that prefix mis from misos, meaning hatred. So transliteration can help us to discover a word's derivatives, and it can help you realise the meaning of an ancient Greek word, or even other English words. We also need transliteration for use in our writing. What do I mean by this? Well, when you're writing a book or an essay for an audience that might not know ancient Greek, and you want to make reference to a Greek word that an author uses, you can transliterate it so that the audience is able to read it. Because if you put in the ancient Greek word, they would not be able to read it, right, if they don't know ancient Greek. So if you transliterate a Greek word, it enables your audience to read the word. So for instance, say you were writing some essay, you might write the following. The concept of misos is integral to the writings of, I don't know, some ancient Greek author. Now you would find this in an academic paper or something like that, but if you were writing for a general audience, then you would not transliterate the circumflex in misos. You would just use a regular I instead, because that would enable uh, a general audience to read the word more easily, because lots of people, I think, would look at that and think, what on earth does that mean, you know? So, yes. But if you're transliterating as part of an academic paper, feel free to use the circumflex and be as precise and pedantic as you like. A second example is, the notion of bios is important for, and then some other ancient Greek author, I don't know who you want to say there, but you can see how transliterations would be useful in our writing. Overall, then, we need transliteration for proper names, for derivatives, and for use in our writing. Now let's go into detail and see how to transliterate any ancient Greek word. Let's start by looking at the equivalent letters in our alphabet. So here is alpha, and the equivalent letter that we will transliterate alpha with is either A or a long A, indicated by a macron above it because remember, alpha can sometimes be long. So if an alpha is long with a macron, you could transliterate it with a long A. Beta is transliterated using B. You can see this is fairly straightforward, but you will see that there are some nuances that you need to learn. Gamma is generally transliterated G. There are exceptions, however, which we shall see shortly. Delta is transliterated D. Epsilon is transliterated E. Zeta is transliterated either as Z or SD. Here's where things get slightly complicated. In transliteration of ancient Greek, there are two different systems of transliteration. Firstly, you have the traditional system, which transliterates things as they would have been transliterated in Latin, as the Romans would have transliterated them. And now Zeta, traditionally, has been transliterated as Z. However, we know that Zeta sounds like Zd, and Z does not sound like Zd. So, the second system of transliteration, which is the modern system of transliteration, renders Zeta as Sd instead. So on the one hand, you have the Latin-based traditional system of transliteration, and on the other, you have the modern system of transliteration, which is closer to the original Greek in terms of the pronunciation, because SD sounds more like Zeta than Z does, for instance. Now, you might be wondering which you should use. Well, it's entirely up to you. It might depend upon the context, but I think that a lot of Greek scholars would agree that we should transliterate familiar words using the traditional system of transliteration. So, for instance, let's look at Zeus's name in ancient Greek, Zdeus. This is traditionally transliterated as Z-E-U-S, Zeus. However, if you wanted to be more accurate, it would be Zeus. But unless somebody knows Greek, they would not really know who you're writing about if you wrote Zeus. So I think many Greek scholars would say that you should stick with the traditional system of transliteration for familiar words. So I think you ought to render names traditionally, okay, as they're known in English now. But if you're writing an essay, for instance, about a certain Greek concept that is not really well known to us in English, doesn't have a well-known English equivalent, then feel free to transliterate that word 
with the old system or with the new system. It's entirely up to you. But you should transliterate familiar words using the traditional system, in my view, because nobody knows who Zdus is. And although most proper names are transliterated, they are not italicized if they are appearing as part of a translated text, or in a text where that character or historical figure is being discussed. And thus I have not put proper names in italics in this presentation. Let's carry on. Eta can be transliterated as E, or E marked with a macron. Now, we know that Eta is always a long vowel, so technically Eta should always be E with a macron, but if you're transliterating a name, for instance, then you should not indicate the vowel length. If you're translating a Greek text and you transliterate Socrates' name in your translation of the text, then you don't need to mark the vowel length on his name, you just write Socrates, for instance. I mean, you can show the vowel length if you're having to be very pedantic for some reason, writing something very scholarly, I'm not sure when you would need to do that, but I would mark the vowel length for words other than names, and I do in this presentation, okay? So I would transliterate eta as e marked with a macron in all cases except proper names. Let's look at this ancient Greek word, epistema. Epistema means knowledge, and it will be transliterated as episteme. This long e here following the Latin pronunciation should be pronounced a, a. So it's episteme. And once again, you could ask about derivatives. Do we get any words from this? Yes, we do. If you're familiar with philosophy, there is a branch of philosophy called epistemology. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Theta is transliterated th. We know that theta is an aspirated t, t, but it came to be pronounced th, and it is transliterated th. Iota can be transliterated as i or a long i, depending upon whether the iota is long. Kappa can be transliterated as C or K, depending upon which system of transliteration you are using. The traditional system of transliteration transliterates kappa as a C, the modern system of transliteration transliterates kappa as a K. So for instance, here's the name of Socrates, Socrates. The old system of transliteration would render it Socrates with a C, and the modern system of transliteration would render it Socrates with a K. Once again, I think we should use the former because Socrates with a K looks unfamiliar. It looks strange to us, you know. These traditional transliterations are sort of ingrained in our knowledge of Greece. You know, we need to stick with these, I think, for names and for familiar words. Moving swiftly on, Lambda is transliterated as L, Mu is transliterated as M, Nu is transliterated as N, and Xi is transliterated as X or KS, depending upon which system of transliteration you're using. So for example, here is the ancient Greek word Xenia. This means hospitality. We could transliterate this as Xenia or as Xenia. I would transliterate it as Xenia like this because this is how it's come to us in English and in scholarship. It's a familiar word. Let's now look at how to transliterate the other half of the alphabet. Omicron ought to be transliterated as O. Pi ought to be transliterated as P. Rho ought to be transliterated as R. Sigma ought to be transliterated as S. Tau ought to be transliterated as T. Upsilon ought to be transliterated as Y using the traditional system of transliteration or U using the modern system of transliteration. And remember that upsilon can be long, and if it is long, you can render it as Y with a macron, or U with a macron, if you wish to be precise. And remember, if you're transliterating a proper name as part of a translation of a Greek text, then you should not indicate the vowel length. You could just transliterate it as Y or U without a macron. Phi ought to be transliterated as PH. Remember, phi should be pronounced P but it came to be pronounced f, and it is in fact transliterated as f, ph. Chi should be transliterated as ch using the traditional system, or kh using the modern system. Psi ought to be transliterated using ps. Finally, omega ought to be transliterated as o. In particular, it should be transliterated as a long o, because omega is a long o sound, or. 
However, the long O in both English and Latin would be pronounced O as in mobile. Here is the ancient Greek word psyche, meaning soul, spirit, life or breath. Using the traditional system of transliteration, you could render this psyche, psyche. And you can see that if you were not to mark the vowel length here, you would have the word psyche. Psyche is just a transliteration of the ancient Greek word psyche, meaning soul. And you can see that this is, of course, where we get words like psychology from. Using the modern system of transliteration, you would render it also as psyche, but using a long u instead of a long y, and using kh instead of ch. I now want to talk to you about transliterating gamma. Gamma is transliterated as g, except in four instances. You will recall I mentioned there are some exceptions, and that you will see those, and you are now about to see those, so here we go. What are these four instances where gamma is not translated as g? Well, in the case of double gamma, you'll remember I did an episode, a lesson, on gamma combos. This is about those. Gamma gamma, you will recall, is pronounced ng, ng, and it is in fact transliterated as ng. So the first gamma here is transliterated as n rather than g. And you will see that in all of these exceptions, gamma is transliterated as n rather than as g. The second exception is gamma kappa, which we know is pronounced nk, and therefore gamma kappa is transliterated as nk. Gamma chi, we know is pronounced nk, and it should be transliterated as nch using the traditional system, or nkh using the modern system. Finally, we have gamma xi. Now, in my gamma combos video, I forgot to mention this fourth and final gamma combo. Gamma xi is pronounced nx, nx, nx. Therefore, it's transliterated either as nx using the traditional system or nks using the modern system. Let's look at an example. Here is the ancient Greek word. Remember to pause the video and try and pronounce it before me. If I give you time, I need to remember to give you time. Sphinx, sphinx, sphinx. This would be transliterated traditionally as Sphinx. The mythical creature with the head of a human, the body of a lion and the wings of an eagle. And now because Sphinx is a familiar word, I've transliterated Xi as X rather than KS. Now with what we've learned, you can transliterate a lot of ancient Greek words, but not all of them just yet. However, we can do some practice with what we've learned. So here is the ancient Greek word, drama. Drama means act, deed, or play. Play as in a theatrical play. It ought to be transliterated, drama. It's where we get our word drama from. Drama is just a transliteration of the ancient Greek word. Secondly, we have the word grapher. Grapher. Grapher is a noun meaning drawing, picture, or writing. It should be transliterated graphe. And now you should be able to see from the transliteration that grapher gives us our English words ending in graphy, like photography, because these things are largely, in some sense, about pictures or drawings. So photography, for example, I've just realised, comes from two Greek words, in fact. It comes from grapher at the end, meaning drawing or picture. But the first word, there is an ancient Greek word, pos, um, which has the stem port, which if you transliterated it would be p-h-o-t, and that means light. Pos with the stem port means light. So I think a photograph is a light picture. That is to say a picture made using light, but I need to check this. So I've just checked and it's correct, which shows you that transliteration does help you make these links and discover derivatives and so forth. The next word is pilia, which means love, affection, or friendship. And if we were to transliterate pilia, then it would be philia. This is where we get the prefix phil, as in philosopher. A philosopher is somebody who loves wisdom, coming from pilia, love, and sopia, wisdom. We also get the suffix file, as in p-h-i-l-e, from pilia. So for example, a bibliophile is somebody who loves books. All of the words with fill and file and filiar in are to do with loving something. And that comes from the ancient Greek word pilia. 
Okay, next we're going to look at how to transliterate diphthongs. Here is the diphthong I. This is traditionally transliterated AE, but in the modern system it's transliterated AI, but both of these will be pronounced I. However, in English words using AE, the AE sound is now often pronounced E rather than I, but it's also fine to pronounce it as I. Next we have alpha upsilon, which was pronounced as ao in ancient Greek. This should be transliterated au. Next we have epsilon iota, a, should be transliterated either as i, using the traditional system of transliteration. In particular, it should be a long i, but if you're transliterating a proper name or you don't want to be pedantic, then you can just use the regular i. Under the modern system, it should be transliterated ei. Next we have Epsilon Upsilon, this should be transliterated EU. Next we have Eta Upsilon, this should be transliterated EU, or if you're being precise, a long E and then a U. Next we have Omicron Iota, this is traditionally transliterated using OE, but under the modern system it is transliterated OI. Second to last we have Omicron Upsilon, which traditionally was transliterated using U, or a long U if you're being specific, but using the modern system of transliteration, it is transliterated OU. Finally, we have the diphthong Upsilon Iota, which should be transliterated UI. Having learned how to transliterate the diphthongs, let's do some more transliteration practice. Here we have the ancient Greek word Aiter. Aiter is a noun referring to the upper air, or the upper sky. Traditionally, it will be transliterated Aether, without indicating the vowel length, that would just be the word ether. Using the modern system, it would be pronounced in the same way, but written using ai instead of ae. Secondly, we have the ancient Greek noun acorn. Acorn means image or likeness. And if you were to transliterate it using the traditional system, it would be econe, or if you didn't indicate the vowel length, icon. And so you can now see where we get our word icon from. If you transliterated it using the modern system, it would be acone. Thirdly, we have the ancient Greek noun musa. Now this is technically a proper name referring to one of the mythical muses. It means muse. To transliterate it traditionally, you would write musa. Now I've indicated the U there as long using a macron rather than the upwards arrow because this is how the word was traditionally transliterated in Latin. However, in the modern transliteration, that would be Musa. Fourthly, we have the noun Keir, which is one of the most difficult nouns to pronounce in my experience of ancient Greek. It means hand. If we were to transliterate this traditionally, it would be Kir. And now you can see where we get the word chiropractor from. To transliterate it using the modern system, it would be Keir, using a KH rather than a CH and using EI rather than just I. Okay, I've just got a bit more to do. Let's talk about transliterating rough breathings. The rough breathing is transliterated as H. So for instance, here is the ancient Greek noun historia, which can mean inquiry. We would transliterate this as historia, historia, and you can see where we get our word history from. Here is the ancient Greek word hopla, hopla, both of these are nouns, I should say. Hopla refers to weapons, and if we were to transliterate it, we would write it as hopla. You can see that for both of these words, there's only one way for us to transliterate it, whatever system of transliteration we use, because there aren't any letters or combinations of letters where we have two choices of transliteration. The word hopla is where we get the word hoplite from. A hoplite was a heavily armed foot soldier in ancient Greece. The word hoplite is in fact an ancient Greek word, seen here, hopliters, which you can pause the video and try transliterating now if you would like. We would write hopliters as hoplites. Once again, we have no choice for how to transliterate hopliters. The only thing you could do is not indicate the vowel length if you're not having to be precise. Remember that if a word begins in rho, then the rho must have a rough breathing above it, even though this rough breathing is not pronounced. Well, rho with a rough breathing is transliterated as rh. In the other cases, in the case of the vowels, you put the h before the vowel 
but in the case of rho with a rough breathing, you transliterate the H after the R. So for instance, here is the ancient Greek word rhetor, meaning public speaker. We would transliterate this rhetor, or if we didn't indicate the vowel length, it would be reta, which is a word we have in English anyway, to mean orator. Now I want to talk to you about transliterating os and on. The very common Greek noun endings os and on can be transliterated as follows. Os, following the traditional system of transliteration, is transliterated us. However, if we're following the modern system of transliteration, then it's transliterated os. On is traditionally transliterated um, but using the modern system, it's transliterated on. This is very important to note, and it's why you see many Greek names ending in us in English. They actually would have ended in os, that is to say Omicron Sigma. But the Romans, when they transliterated these Greek words, transliterated them using their equivalent noun endings. And the Roman equivalent of the Greek noun ending os is us. The Roman equivalent of the Greek noun ending on is um. So here it does make a substantial difference which system of transliteration you're using. Having learned this, let's do some more practice. Here is the Greek noun angelos, meaning messenger, or later, angel. If we were to transliterate this traditionally, it would be angelos. If we transliterate it in the modern way, it would be angelos. Here we have another Greek noun, choros, choros, which refers to the chorus in a Greek play. Traditionally transliterating this, we would get chorus, or pronounced in the Latin manner, chorus. Transliterating it in the modern manner, we get choros. Thirdly, we have the noun emporion. An emporion is a trading post. Look at that ending on. Remember, traditionally, that should be um. Therefore, if we traditionally transliterate this, we get emporium or emporium, which is a word we have in English today. Transliterating emporion using the modern system, we get emporion. Fourthly, we have the noun stadion. A stadion was a length. It was a unit of measurement, one stade, S-T-A-D-E. However, it could also mean race course as well. And if we traditionally transliterate it, we get stadium or stadium in English. The way I'm pronouncing these words at first is in the Latin style, but in English we would say stadium. Using the modern system, we would get stadion. Fifthly, we have a proper name here, Herakleitos. Traditionally transliterated, this would be Heraclitus. Transliterated in the modern style, this would be Heracleitos. Now I just wish to note two things about proper names. Firstly, some proper names lose their ending when they're transliterated. For example, here we have Homeros, Homer's name in ancient Greek. If we transliterate this using the traditional system, we get Homerus. If we transliterate it with the modern system, we get Homeros. However, in English, we have it as Homer. You can see the ending is lost. Likewise with Platon, this should be Platon, but instead in English we have it as Plato. Thirdly, we have Helena. This should be Helena, but instead in English we have it as Helen. Fourthly, we have a Euclides. This should be Euclides, but instead it's Euclid. So note that some proper names lose their ending when transliterated. The second thing I want to note about proper names is that some of them undergo unexpected changes and they are translated rather than transliterated. For example, here we have the name Ayas. This is a character from the Iliad. Can you guess who it is? Well, if we transliterated it with the traditional system, that should be Ayas, or with the modern system, it should also be Ayas. But still, it's not how the name has come to us in English. The name in English is Ajax. And if you were translating the Iliad, I think you ought to render it Ajax. So note that some names are translated rather than transliterated. Likewise, here we have Achilleus. Traditionally transliterated, this would be Achilles, and it will be pronounced the same in the modern system, but it's come to us in English as Achilles. You can see the Upsilon has dropped out, essentially. There's no 
letter corresponding to Upsilon in Achilles' name, as it is in English. Thirdly, we have Aristoteles, which should be transliterated as Aristoteles, but instead, in English, we know him as Aristotle. Last of all, I want to talk to you about transliterating the iota subscript. The iota subscript is often not transliterated. You frequently do not see it transliterated in derivatives. But if you wish to be accurate, then you can transliterate it as I, following the vowel that it appears beneath. So, for instance, here is the ancient Greek word oider, which means song or poem. If we transliterate the iota subscript, then we get oide. But if we ignore the iota subscript and we don't indicate vowel length, we get oud. And you can see where the English word oud comes from. Here we have the noun zdoion. Zdoion refers to a living creature or an animal. If we transliterated this using the modern system and transliterating the iota subscript, we would get zdoion. But if we ignore the iota subscript, and if we use the traditional system of transliteration, we get zoon. And you can now see where we get our word zoo from. Thirdly, we have the noun rapsoidos, which refers to a rhapsode. A rhapsode was a reciter of epic poetry. If we acknowledge the iota subscript, we would transliterate this rapsoidos. But if we ignore it, we transliterate this rapsodos. And this is where we get our words rhapsode, of course, and rhapsody from. You can actually see that the word oide is present in rhapsoidos. You can see the oid bit because a rhapsode, a rhapsoidos, etymologically, was a song stitcher. Raptor is a verb meaning stitch and oide means song. So a rhapsode was etymologically a song stitcher. Fun fact for you there. Okay, to finish up, I've got seven words for you to practice transliterating. Remember to pause the video and try it yourself beforehand using whichever system of transliteration you prefer. The first word is a proper name, a eutudermos. Traditionally, this would be euthydemus, but using the modern system, this would be transliterated euthydemos. Here we have the ancient Greek noun teos. Teos refers to a god. A teos is a god. We would transliterate this word as theos. Now you might wonder, couldn't we transliterate it as theos using the Latin ending? And now in principle you could, but because the derivatives in English have used o instead of u, I think we ought to transliterate it using the o instead. So for instance, the words theology and theocracy both keep the o. However, if you did transliterate it using the us, well done for remembering that many words ending in os could be transliterated using us. Here we have another proper name, xenoporn. Xenoporn. Traditionally, this would be transliterated xenophon. However, if you wanted to use the modern system, which I would not recommend for names like xenophon, then it would be xenophon. Fourthly, we have the noun daimon. A daimon was a spirit or a god. We would transliterate this traditionally as daimon, and you can see where we get our English word demon from, although note that a daimon in ancient Greek is not a demon, it is just a spirit or a god. Using the modern system it would be daimon also, but with ai instead of ae. Fifthly, ergon. Ergon means task, deed or work. It will be transliterated under either system as ergon, and this is where we get ergonomic from, for example. Two more words. We have the proper name Oedipus. This would traditionally be Oedipus. Note that that combination O-E is now pronounced E, Oedipus, but in Latin that sound would have been pronounced Oi. Now in English though we say E, so Oedipus. Using the modern system of transliteration it would be Oedipus. You can see that the modern system more accurately reflects the Greek but it looks less familiar to us, you know. Oedipus's name is familiar to us in the first form, not the second one. Lastly, we have the noun Haima. If we transliterate this using the traditional system, we get Hema. Remember that AE combination in these words is now pronounced E in English, but 
In Latin, that would have been pronounced I. And now we can see some derivatives. I think haemophobia is the fear of blood, and there's also something called haemoglobin that you have to learn about in GCSE science, but that was not my passion, so I don't remember the details there. Something about blood, haemoglobin, some thing in the body. Anyway, um, you could transliterate it using the modern system as hyma, and you can indicate the circumflex using the arrow if you wish. Okay, that's all. That's all. It's been a long lesson, but it's been a fun lesson, I hope. I'm not sure. Transliteration isn't the most exciting thing, but you need to know it, okay? However, I want to finish this lesson with a little rant, okay? If you do become a sort of classics academic in the future, then please, when you're writing a paper, please do not transliterate an entire paragraph of ancient Greek. Some academics do this. They will transliterate a whole paragraph of ancient Greek. And now, transliteration is useful for one word, but if you're transliterating a whole paragraph, who is this benefiting, you know? Because it's actually more difficult for a Greek scholar to read that paragraph in English than it is in Greek, because it means you've got to convert those letters from the English alphabet back into ancient Greek to work out what words are being quoted, you know? Transliteration is useful for one word, but not for a paragraph. Who is that benefiting? Who does it benefit to transliterate a paragraph? Because if somebody's reading a paper where a paragraph of Greek is being quoted, surely they're able to read ancient Greek at that point anyway, you know? Anyway, please, if you use transliteration in the future, use it for like one word or a few words, okay? Not for a paragraph. If you're quoting a paragraph of Greek, please quote it in the actual Greek, okay? But transliteration is useful for one word. Anyway, rant over. Thank you for watching, I hope you've got something out of this lesson, and I shall continue the course soon, although I'm very busy, so I'm trying to do one lesson a month or something like that, this is a very long-term project, you know. Goodbye for now, all the best.